Praise the Lord. Good to see you this evening. Would you stand with me, please? And Stephanie, if you would ask the Lord to bless our service this evening. Dear Lord, we praise and thank you for this opportunity to come to your house to help us to praise and worship you to the best of our abilities, Lord, and to listen and to learn more about you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's begin by singing, How Great Is Our God, How Great Is His Name. How great is our God. Oh 
and praise the Lord. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank you all the days of my life. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I thank you all the days of my life. Oh, when I was lost.
around us, and so that we can be prepared to stand with your strength, Lord, against the wiles of the enemy, and to come against the falsehoods that are being sown, so that, dear Lord Jesus, your truth will prevail. And we know, dear Lord Jesus, that victory is ours. We thank you, Lord, that we can have that oil of gladness that comes into our lives, and it's all because of you. It's all because of the sacrifice that you made, not only in your life, but in your death. And so, Father, today we want to remember, we want to glorify your name. We want to lift you up so that your name would be high and lifted up above everything else. doesn't matter what we do and who we are, what name we may bear, but Lord Jesus, help us to look to the cross and to remember what you have done, the pain that you suffered, and the victory that you won. And so, Father, I pray tonight that as we look to the Word, that you would help it to be a strength to us, and we give you praise and honor and glory for every word that is in the Gospel, that is in the Bible, that you have provided for us by your Spirit. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to start with uh, what may seem as a rather odd scripture to be reading on a good Friday. Uh, but if you'll bear with me, I hope that you will see uh, where I'm going here with regards to the cross. It's a message about the cross, of course, uh, today as we remember that sacrifice. But I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. One thing we know about Scripture is that it is consistent and that it is supportive of itself and it does not, if we look at it very carefully, it does not contain conflict. Uh, if there is a conflict, it's because we don't understand. It's not because of the Word of God. And what I'd like to do this evening is to briefly uh, walk through a consistency something that we see throughout the scripture that is very, very important with regards to the cross and how the cross impacts uh, every one of our lives and how Jesus paid that price for each and every one who was willing to receive. Um, and so I'm starting here with uh, a parable uh, that Jesus told with regards to the kingdom. And so it's not necessarily one that we would associate with the cross, but there are some verses here that I want to highlight. So I'm going to read a fair bit, starting in Matthew 22, starting at verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now there are two pieces there I'm going to just stop. Uh, I have to highlight. Uh, there are two pieces in that verse that are very, very important. The first one is that there was a call, all right? And there was a call uh, to them that were bidden to the wedding, and we're going to look and see a consistency, I believe, in the scripture with regards to who is invited, okay? But, out of those that were invited, it says, and they would not come. So there's two pieces there. There's the invitation, and then there's either the rejection or the acceptance of the invitation. And in this particular case, we have a rejection. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant, remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants 
went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there was there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. I'm, I was led to this section of scripture because my um, primary thought as uh, the Lord was speaking to me about a message for this evening uh, comes from the, a hymn. And the hymn that I was thinking about was, and the chorus goes, The ground is level at the foot of the cross. No man stands higher than I. I can call on Jesus' name, and a king can do the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. What I would like to draw to your attention uh, this evening is the inclusivity, or how inclusive, the cross really is. Um, you know, people think they're kind of smart. And you will find people that think that they've come up with this brilliant new idea. And so in society today, we have this theme, which I believe is not properly applied, with regards to having an inclusive society. Now, in the world's definition, and notice I'm saying in the world's definition of what is inclusive, it means, as I would define it, basically accepting everybody any way that they are and putting everybody together and trying to live in some form of harmonious fellowship, although everybody is different. And so we want to include everyone. Well, this evening I want to point out to you that as I look at the scripture and as I think about the cross, and of course, on this Good Friday, we, we do highlight and we consider the cross. I want you to think about the fact that, first of all, there is no idea that man d develops or comes up with that God hasn't already thought of. Right? Like, I mean, this should be obvious to us as God's people. God created everything. He created not only the things that we see and that we touch, he also created the things that are invisible to our natural eyes that through science we're starting to discover now. Those things that are so tiny that we can't see them that are inside of us and inside everything that is around us. But he also created all concepts and all thoughts. All of these things are part of God's creation. And this evening I want to show you that God is all about being inclusive. And before you get all excited, I'm not talking about compromise. I'm not talking about having no standards. But I want to show you that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for everyone. Absolutely everyone. When Jesus was born, he came for everyone. Now, not everyone accepts. But that's not God's fault. You see, I believe, if, even if you look, and we're not going to turn, but if you look all the way to the beginning of God's design, when I look at the Garden of Eden, and I look at the uh, balance, I look at the um, relationship that God developed between the earth that he created and, and the, the, you know, the universe that he created and then all of the plants and all of the animals and then uh, the man and the woman that he put on, on the earth. All of these things to work harmoniously in a very inclusive fashion because God built the entire world to function together. It doesn't fit into God's character 
that he would have anything that he created that would be contrary to something else. And so I believe that, you know, that until the fall, and if we look at Scripture, you know, the, the animals were in fellowship with each other. They functioned together. They were all inclusive. And it is only because of sin and only because of our poor choices that that inclusivity that I see throughout the Scripture has been hurt. But God has a plan to bring it all back together again. Now that doesn't mean every person is going to be included. But that is only because of their own choice. I'm jumping a little bit here, but as I uh, sort of lay this out for you, and I want you to think about that cross that Christ died for you, and he died for me. And, you know, he died for me when I was still a sinner. But the cross provides the gateway, the blood that Jesus shed on that cross, the, the sins and all of the iniquities that he bore on that cross, he bore for me, yet while I was still a sinner, but so that I would have, as a sinner, an opportunity to be included in God's plan. So this symbol that we have, to me, is a very, very inclusive. It is, in fact, what I think God shows us is the real definition of inclusiveness. Because God wants all to be part of the family of God. So when somebody comes to you and says, oh, well, you know, Christians are, you know, they're excluding this group and they're excluding that group and they're excluding another group. That's not so. We don't exclude anyone. They exclude themselves because they don't agree to come up to the standard which God has set. You need to kind of wrap yourself into this a little bit. And think about it this way. The world wants to be inclusive, right? They say we want to have an inclusive society. Yet the world still has standards, right? I mean, we don't agree with their standards. But the world still has standards. So even in the world's inclusive society, where they say everybody, we need to include everybody, we need to be tolerable, even to the world that talks about being tolerant and being inclusive, there are some things that are not allowed. Right? I mean, they have laws. They have rules. I mean, if they say we want to be totally inclusive, then wouldn't that mean that even those that uh, break laws or even those that, uh, you know, do things that are... Uh, sexually perverse or any of those kind of things maybe we shouldn't judge any of them if we're going to be truly inclusive so when the world comes to you and says well we're inclusive and you're not remind them politely but remind them that they too have laws and standards that they set that in order to be inclusive in what they say is society, they want people to abide by those laws and standards. Can you see how for a Christian to say, truly, that God is absolutely inclusive, we can say that our standard is God's word. That's the only difference. It's a big difference. But it certainly means that when the Bible tells me, and turn with me to 1 Timothy, as our first sort of verse to help you see this. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is a good and ex for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So the simple statement that was a revelation here to Paul as he's writing to Timothy was that he saw as God showed him that God would have all men to be saved. Now you can't tell me that's not inclusive. And that's why the cross that Jesus bore, the pain and the suffering that he lived through and died under, was for everyone. Absolutely everyone. Because God wants to be inclusive. See, if, if that were not so, then Jesus would have gone to the cross only for the Jewish sinner or for some other group, okay, or only for men, since it was a male-dominant society. But that's not the case. He went to the cross for those in slavery, those that were of any gender, those that were of any race, any creed, any language, who would receive? Who would, as it says here in this scripture that I just read, Come unto the knowledge of the truth. That in the inclusive society that God is wanting to form. And he will form. See, heaven's going to be very inclusive. It's going to include the rich and the poor. It's going to include all races. All that had all kinds of different languages while they were alive in our natural form, right? It's going to include all of those things. But in that inclusive society, in that inclusive realm of heaven, everything has to abide by God's standard. And then we say we are a family of God. But the cross that Jesus bore to me, is the starting spot. You know, we, we sometimes look at uh, Christ's death on the cross, and certainly his disciples saw it as an enemy. Right? They didn't understand what was happening and the spiritual implications of what Jesus was saying uh, during the Last Supper and, and what was going to happen after the cross. But really, the cross is a crucial beginning because it provides that way for everyone to be included in the family of God if they receive. Luke chapter 19, Jesus tells us himself in Luke 19 and verse 10. And here's another good example that the world really at the time could not fathom. Because Jesus here is speaking, in, in chapter 10 we have the account of Zacchaeus, right? And to the religious system of the day, the religious church that looked like they were um, only for a few, to that religious system, when they see Jesus with Zacchaeus, who is really as somebody on the outside. Yet Jesus was including him, or at least giving Zacchaeus an opportunity. See, the cross was for him too. Even though the world despised him. He had to change. He had to accept. But the cross was for Zacchaeus just like it was for the disciples that were following Jesus. And Jesus himself says, in verses 9 and 10 there, in chapter 19 of Luke, Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation, come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. See, Jesus makes Zacchaeus part of the group, because Zacchaeus accepts. And it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save, and of course the key piece here, that which 
was lost. That which was lost. <clears throat> it reminds me, and it really, for me, it even highlights even more what Jesus did for everyone on that day when he went to Calvary. And he allowed, let's not forget, Jesus allows the Romans to nail him to a cross. Jesus allows them to humiliate him in a trial. He allows the soldiers to beat him. He allows the soldiers to flay his flesh with the whips. Jesus allows all of that. Okay? Um, why? Because he wants everyone to have an, an opportunity to be included in salvation. And so, right from the very beginning, right, early on in his ministry, it was about finding those that are lost and it, inviting them to come to the wedding, inviting them to come, as we read in Matthew, to this feast that had been prepared. And, you know, in that section that I read in Matthew, you, you, you need not turn back to it, but I mean, verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen, is again another example that I wanted to highlight for you, <coughs> excuse me, of how inclusive God is. When he speaks about the many who are called, in the end, I believe that's everybody. But you'll notice the one who came in who was not appropriately dressed. And Jesus is using there an image of how we have to be appropriately spiritually dressed to be part of what God is building, his family. The one who was not appropriately dressed was removed. Now, some would say, well, how can that be inclusive? Just remember, the world has rules and laws and standards as well, okay? And God's standards are perfect. God's standards are absolute, whereas the worlds are always shifting. So, you know, it, it's, it, I don't know about you, but I'll say it. Sometimes I read things where people are trying to be inclusive, and it actually upsets me. Because in the natural, stop and think about this, is there really a way to include absolutely every group? Short of God's plan? And I would say to you, I don't believe that there is. There's always going to be another group. Unfortunately. That's the way people think. But the Lord himself, when we see you know, a verse that we know very well in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. Galatians 3 and 28. Actually, I'll start at verse 26. Galatians 3 and 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So he's talking there about what is required. And you see, on a day like today, it is your faith and my faith that allows us to accept and believe and to know that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me and that by faith we know that Jesus was the Son of God. He wasn't just some other good guy or some prophet or anything like that. He was God in the flesh. It's our faith that allows us to hold on to that. Okay? And then the scripture goes on. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That's true inclusivity. That's a truly inclusive society where the Lord says that once we are saved, which is what God's plan was right from the very beginning, that we are then all the same. You see, it's only in the Christian faith 
in the family of God, as children of God, that there is real equality, I'll say. Real inclusivity. I was reading something, and what jumps into my mind, it had something to do with the school board, and I won't get into a lot of details, but there was a particular group representing a particular uh, section of society, and right away, we have a problem with inclusivity, because we have all of these different sections, and this particular group was providing a report to the school board. And they were talking about how they want to go into the schools and they want to do an analysis and they want to do a study. And then they listed, they wanted to see if there were any uh, racist or any bigoted or any kind of exclusionary things that were happening. And then they listed, I think it was maybe four or five specific groups. And immediately my brain went, what about all the other groups? They don't count. They're not important. I understand why they only list four or five, because if you listed every group, you couldn't do it. It's sort of like uh, what Pastor John mentions uh, often, right? We have the LGBTQ, and now they've added a few more initials, and a few more, and a few more, and a few more, and a few more, and, few more. and then they have a plus sign. You know, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why does it keep getting bigger? Why isn't it just the L? Well, because as natural humans, we're all divided. Sin has divided. Whereas God says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. And we just finished reading about Zacchaeus, who was also Abraham's seed. Why? Because he became part of an inclusive group, the family of God. The family of God. See, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Every one of us, to be thankful for the cross, Every one of us needing to come in that very, very same way. And that standard that Jesus sets, and I'll close just looking quickly at a verse and a section of scripture in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. You see, because as Christians, we have to be honest, right? It's not everything goes. Not even close. Now, everything goes coming in to be with the Lord. And what I mean by that is we all come with our baggage, we all come with our luggage, we all come with our faults, our failures, our sin. But, that's where everything goes stops. Because when we truly come to the foot of the cross, just as we are, and we truly accept the Savior's blood and his gift of salvation, then, as it says in Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, and when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. See, we have to, at that point, take up our cross. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about denying self. He's talking about, I die daily so that the Lord can take control of me. And when you stop and you think about it, as Jesus here was speaking, right, about the cross, when Jesus went to the cross, he denied himself. And what I mean is, he sacrificed himself. He denied himself of life. He denied himself of feeling no pain. When he comes in the form of a man, he denies himself from heaven. Right? He removes himself from the perfect place so that he could 
let us know that he understands and experiences and knows everything that we know, short of sin. And so when Jesus tells us to follow him and take up our cross, it's really speaking of how Jesus took up everybody's cross on that day, which is really hard for my mind to comprehend what he carried on that day. But he denied himself, gave his will to the Father, and Jesus is saying that as we remember what he did, we need to do the same. We need to deny ourselves and give ourselves to the Father. I'm so thankful that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Because that means and meant that I had a chance. That I had a chance to come to the Lord just as I was. And even today, I can come to the Lord just as I am. And it's all because of what Jesus did at Calvary. Stand with me, please. And let us hold fast to the truth and to the blessing of this day. And as we pray, let us just ask the Lord to help you. And I'm going to ask the Lord to help me. And we'll pray during this time of what we believe to be, by faith, a miracle time. A time of life. A time of renewal. A time when the God who can do anything will in fact do anything. So we have prayer requests and we might perhaps have needs in our own homes, our own bodies, our workplaces, wherever it might happen to be. Remember, the ground is level, so you can come. You don't need a special invitation, per se, and you don't need a special uh, degree or status, any of those things. No, you can come to the cross. Jesus is waiting. He's waiting for you and he's waiting for me because he's there to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you. Father, on this very blessed day, on this very special day, on a day, dear Lord God, that sometimes the, this Easter season seems to be overshadowed by the Christmas season, and yet they are so important to one another that we as God's people help us to hold fast to the truth and the significance of what, in fact, was done for me and for all of my brothers and sisters and for everyone who does not yet even know Christ as their Savior. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you loved everyone so much that you went to the cross, that you went to the cross. And so, Jesus, this evening, as we've considered and as we've looked to your word and we see how you want us to all be part of the family of God, you want everyone to accept you Lord, how the cross is so inclusive and how, dear Lord, the standard is so firm and so true that makes us all part of your family. I thank you, Lord, for that gift that you gave so many, many years ago and that the power of the cross and the power of your blood and the power of the gift of salvation is still the same today. Still the same today, and it will never lose its power. For Lord, you are of course the source of that power, and you will never lose yours, your power. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this chance to be together this evening. I pray for all those that are not here. Lord, as you see them and you understand where they are, what they're doing, where their focus is, whether they've been distracted today or whether they are thinking about you and the blessing of your gift. Lord God, you are the judge. You are the one who sees. And we just pray, Lord, that you will strengthen everyone and that you will help, dear Lord Jesus, those that are not feeling well and those, dear Jesus, that want to just, Lord, draw them nigh, draw them closer to you so that they can feel the touch and the power of your word. We thank you and we praise you. 
and ask Lord Jesus, truly, be with us as we pray now individually. Touch and meet our needs, I ask in Jesus' name.